Tonight, I want to tell you three fantasies, all of which have something in common. The first fantasy about is about reproduction. We use the word reproduction in two principal ways. When we talk about the biological reproduction of the species, and when we talk about making a good reproduction of something in terms of a painting, a photograph, or a recording, or a videotape. And what is all this about reproduction in that direction? Hundreds of years ago, kings of Europe who wanted to form feudal alliances by marrying the princesses of far-off states would have painters send portraits of the lady in question to see if his majesty approved of her before he got her. And there's a famous story in which Henry VIII of England was badly cheated in this respect by a too flattering portrait of Anne of Cleves. And therefore there grew up a kind of uh, morale among artists in the European tradition to make faithful reproductions of people. And they perfected their technique beginning with the marvelous work of the Renaissance painters and the Flemish painters, and going on finally to what was called art officiel in the 19th century, we got what we now call photographic realism. But then they said, isn't there some more scientific way of doing this? And so they discovered the camera. And first of all, there were, you know, remember those brownish daguerreotypes? And people said, well, that is pretty. It really looks like Grandpa, doesn't it? And then they said, but uh, something, uh, uh, several things missing. It isn't colored. So first of all, they tinted. And then they said, well, it's real lifelike. But then they went on to say, but you know, there are some people whose whole style of life whose personality is in the way they move and if you just take a static shot like that the personality isn't there it's the way they go so he said we've got to have some way of making people move so they invented the movies and i remember when the first movies came out they were all going Everybody was going, you know, in a jerky way. Then they smoothed it out and they said, oh, that's real lifelike. But they said then, but there's another thing about reproducing people, which is that um, they talk and a whole lot of their personality is in the voice. So can't we have them talking at the same time that they move? So they invented the talkies. And then to get it more lifelike still, they colored them said, wow, now we're really getting somewhere. Then, uh, to make it even more real, they put it in 3D. And you had to wear sort of spectacles over your face to see it that way. But then they went on to say, why is it that every time we want to see one of these things, we have to go down uh, to the center of town? Can't we have it all at home? And so television came on. And in television, they first of all started out with black and white, and it was kind of uh, like Robert Benchley once described the cuts in French newspapers as all looking as if they'd been made on bread. Well, that was television in a certain period. And then they improved it, and then they colored it, and that's where we are now. Not quite. Because somebody has come out with the thing that we shall all be seeing soon, which is the hologram. A television image produced by laser beams where you see a three-dimensional figure out in the air in front of you. So isn't that And then, uh, but of course, when you go up to it and you put your hand on it, your hand goes right through it. You can't touch it. And you see, that was always the trouble with television because you look at whatever you're seeing behind the screen. It's intangible, it doesn't smell, and it won't relate to you. So these are further problems to be solved in the techniques of electronic reproduction, and they'll do it. 
They'll first of all manage a way in which the electronic emission sources can solidify and make the air vibrate so that you go up and you'll touch the figure and you won't be able to push your hand through it because the air will be going faster than your hand. Imagine that. You can actually, if there's a beautiful dancer on the television, you'll be able to go up and embrace her. But she won't know you're there. And she won't respond to you. And you'll say, well, that's not very lifelike. Just as they once said, yeah, if the photograph doesn't move, it's not very lifelike. If it doesn't talk, it's not very lifelike. They'll next say, if the reproduction in three dimensions solid doesn't respond, it's not very lifelike. So they'll have to figure out a technique for doing that. What will they do? Well, I tell you, sitting in your home, where you're watching the scene on a kind of stage now, not on the screen, there'll be a TV camera observing you. And that TV camera will report back everything you do into a computer. And the computer will so manage each bit of information, that's to say, each tiny little um, granule unit of information going into the image that you're looking at, that it will immediately decide what is the appropriate response to the approach that you are making to the image. Won't that be crazy? You know, she may slap you in the face, and she may kiss you. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but then, they say, now, this is still not really the kind of reproduction we wanted. What we wanted when we looked at the scene is to be able to identify with one of the characters. We wanted to not just watch the drama that's being performed on the stage in front of us, but actually get into it. And so we want to be wired in with a... Electro, um, electrodes on the brain so that we will actually feel the emotions of the people acting on the stage. And so eventually we will get absolutely perfect reproduction and we will be able to see that image so vividly that we shall become it. And so the question arises, could that be where we are already? Are we a reproduction which over the centuries of evolution has worked out to be a replica of something else that was going on and we are where we always were? Now the next fantasy concerns the idea that every living being thinks it's human. And that means a plant, a worm, a virus, a bacterium, a fruit fly, a hippopotamus, a giraffe, a rabbit. That all these beings, wherever they feel out from, as we feel out from our bodies, feel that they're in the middle. That is to say, wherever you look, you turn your head around, and you feel you're in the middle of the world. You feel you're, you're the center. And a rabbit or a fruit fly feels that it is a center. And it has around it a company of associates who look like it. And therefore, this creature knows that these are the right people, just as we know when we look at human beings. Uh, they're the right people. They are one of us. Only, of course, we have to make distinctions because you never really know uh, that you are you and that you are really in the right place unless you can contrast yourself with some other people who are after all not quite in the right place and some other people who are very much in the wrong place <laughs> and then through having this succession of comparisons you know that you're okay well the insect has exactly the same arrangement well you say well insects and, and things like fishes uh, they don't have a culture what do you mean fishes being civilized that being entitled to consider themselves as human. Well, let me put the argument from the fish's point of view. <laughs> Fishes say, human beings are a mess. Look what they do. They, they can't exist without cluttering themselves and carrying around all kinds of things outside their bodies. They have to have houses, 
an automobile, and books, books, and records, and television, and hi-fi equipment, and stuff, endless stuff, and they litter the earth with rubbish. So think of a dolphin. He isn't really a fish because a dolphin's a mammal, but a dolphin's point of view towards the human race. Dolphins spend most of their time playing. They don't work because the grocery is right there in the ocean, whatever they need. And so a dolphin will uh, catch up with a seagoing liner and it'll get on the wake of the liner and put its tail at an exact angle of 26 degrees. And in so doing, the liner will carry the dolphin along. The dolphin will make circles around the liner just for fun, playing all its life in the world. And uh, we know that a dolphin's brain is as big, if not bigger than ours. It is incredibly intelligent, and it has a language which we can't decipher. And the person who knows most about dolphins in the United States, Dr. John Lilly, is a friend of mine, and he said he came to the conclusion that dolphins were too smart to tell us their language. So he abandoned this project. He said he would no longer keep such a highly civilized being in the concentration camp of the zoo. So the point is that every, not only dolphins, but every organism that has any sensitivity in it whatsoever considers itself to be the center of the universe. Now it has its problems. There's a Zen poem which says, the morning glory which blooms for an hour differs not at heart from a giant pine that lives for a thousand years. In other words, an hour is a long life to a morning. A thousand years is a long life to a time. And our four score years and ten, or as the insurance company's actuarial tables put it, somewhere between 65 and 70 years is an average human life, seems about the right length of life. I mean, there are people who want to go on and on and uh, are in quest of immortality and have their bodies frozen in case there should develop in the future some technique by which they could be revived. But I, I really don't go for that. Because nature has mercifully arranged the principle of forgettery as well as the principle of memory. If you always and always and always remembered everything, you see, you would be like a piece of paper which had been painted over and painted over and painted over until there was no space left and you wouldn't be able to distinguish between one thing and another. It's like when a whole bunch of people who start to scream and make noises and out scream each other. Soon you can hear nobody. So in that way one's memories become screams and nature mercifully arranges that the whole thing be erased. It doesn't matter in what form you begin, whether you begin again as a human being or as a fruit fly, a butterfly, or a beetle, or a bird. It, it feels the same way that you feel now. So we're really all in the same place. We all have above us things much higher than us. And we all have below us things that we feel are much lower than ourselves, just as there are things out there on the left and things out there on the right, and things in front and things behind. Because you're the middle. You're the middle everywhere, always.